cookbook author, culinary teacher, and chef. When I meet people, they always ask me where you're from, so let's get that out of the way. I was born in British Hong Kong to a Macanese family, um, and my family was well-to-do, so I had a very privileged childhood, and we had servants in our household. As a result, I never learned to cook. In fact, I was so ignorant of cooking that the first time I was asked to warm a can of soup, this is what I did. I took the can, I ran it under hot water, I very carefully peeled off the label. <laughs> then I popped the unopened can into a pot of water and I stood over it, waiting for it to boil. That was the point when I thought to myself, how am I going to know when the soup is hot? Well, <laughs> I had to admit defeat, swallow my pride, and ask for help. Obviously, cooking was of no interest to me. All I wanted to do was have fun, and I, and I did. <laughs> However, I did eventually learn to cook, and I loved the challenge of cooking. However, in those days, I did learn other more valuable lessons when I grew up in the 50s in Hong Kong, women's expectations were very limited. This was particularly true in British Hong Kong, where your ethnic background affected your work and pay. I never felt limited by my expectations because I was very fortunate in the women who influenced my thinking. The Marinol sisters educated me and these women were extraordinary. They were feminists way, way before their time. They taught me a strong sense of my own self, and they urged me to aspire to the limits, to reach for the stars, and I did. <laughs> I set my standards very high, and I never thought I couldn't succeed in that. But equally important, they taught us about failure. If you aspire to high things, fear of fa failure is always there. And fear of change is even more daunting. However, if you embrace these fears, you open up a wider, fuller life experience. During my teenage years, my mother, a, a gentle, loving person, was forced through widowhood to provide for her family. She's 42 in that picture six years after she was widowed. I saw through her example how she was able to summon up the determination to provide for us. She didn't let accepted norms of behavior deter her. As a result, she instilled in her daughters a sense of independence and the need to think for ourselves. She also told us it was very important that we would become self-sufficient and be able to earn our own living in life. Now, mentors don't always have to be women. When I started cooking, I was very fortunate to meet Peter Kump. Peter was my mentor in all things cooking and in the cooking world. He was a leading figure in that world and the moving force behind the founding of the Beard Foundation. Obviously, Peter taught me a lot. But the most important thing he taught me was to value myself and to value my work and to stand firm on this because people would respect me all the more for that. I started cooking professionally very late in life. I hadn't been to cooking school and I was already a mother of two. I had spent my working life in the corporate world. My first job in Hong Kong was for BOAC, now known as British Airways. I started as a lowly clerk and I worked my way up to being the private secretary to the advertising manager for all of the Eastern routes. This was quite an important job. It required a lot of independent thinking and initiative. And I guess I was pretty good at it because when I quit to move to England, my ex-boss, who was now my superior at the home office, immediately Telex and offered me a job in London. Well, young as I was, I was smart enough to know I had to negotiate a transfer. 
Transfers for local employee in those days was unheard of. But I stood my ground, so I got my transfer, and they also threw in a free ticket all the way to London. <laughs> I guess in those days, I, was, I had already developed a very strong sense of myself. Over the years, I've worked in different offices in different countries all over Europe. I even did a short stint teaching English at Berlitz in Caracas, Venezuela. I met many people that I liked, and some of them have been remained my friends to this day. But the work that I did didn't really challenge me. So I quit that world and went into cooking. And when I did, I never thought I couldn't succeed, even though I never went to cooking school. But I knew about food, and I knew how to cook, and I knew my food tasted good. Along the way, I also knew I wanted to achieve something valuable. When I began my career as a chef, I thought my life's work would be all about cooking and food. And when I opened my restaurant, I thought the food would be the star. I'm not here today to teach how to julienne a carrot or to talk about my achievements in food. What I want to talk about is something that's very close to my heart and I'm very proud of it. And that's the positive influence I was able to bring to the young people who worked for me. I know I'm blessed to have my background, and today I'm seen as a strong and powerful woman. <laughs> I've watched many changes for women over the years, and women have risen to more and more empowerment. However, I was struck by the fact that I didn't see this empowerment in my young colleagues. They didn't seem to have a strong sense of themselves, and this resulted in low self-esteem. I wanted these young people on the threshold of life to dream big, to realize their potential, a chance they may never get again. I wanted them to learn to recognize the self-worth within them, the self-confidence that they all had, and I wanted them to know that fear of failure should not deter them from taking these chances, because a sense of self would be the key to their achieving what they enjoyed doing, to their success, their happiness, and possibly even their ability to change the world. The world was their oyster. I wanted these kids to grab that oyster, crack it open, and swallow it up. Now, this is what I did. It's very difficult to get young people to open up to you. I knew I had to gain their trust and friendship. So this is what I did. I listened, I empathized, and I encouraged them to talk to me. So as we became friends, obviously, this became easier. So they would talk to me about their dreams, their aspirations, and most importantly, their decisions. I encourage them to look inside themselves at all the positive qualities they already had, the self-confidence within them. And I wanted them to strive to do what would make them happy, because if they did that, that would be the key to their success, the key to their happiness, even the key to their possibly changing the world. I praised and supported every move they made, and I didn't discourage them. Over time, I'm happy to say, I was lucky enough to help a few young people. There are a few of them sitting right here. But my example is not someone in this audience. This was a young woman I was mentoring through a culinary group. She, as a young girl, she had left her home in England and traveled all over the world in independently and extensively, ending up in New York, where she married and started a family. Here was a woman who should have been brimming over with self-confidence. But there's always the possibility of the edge of your self-confidence being taken away from years of being a homemaker. I know this because I was a homemaker for many years myself. When I met her, she had taken culinary classes 
and she wanted to be a teacher in the public school system. I had about my doubts about this choice, but I helped her with networking and I encouraged her and I even arranged an interview for her with someone in the public school system. This interview was really enlightening. She came away knowing just how much work was expected of her and just how little the pay would be. <laughs> Talking about money is always difficult. So I had to gain her trust and friendship. And over time we did, at, the, at which time I asked her to evaluate the mon monetary rewards she would get from teaching. I learned that money was not essential to her, but it was a factor. Was this a factor in her placing a market value on her self-worth? And was this something she really enjoyed doing? I realized that the money she would be able to earn on the marketplace would affect the judgment of herself, of her own self-worth. So with this in mind, I gave her a present of a gift to spend a whole day working with a food stylist. I didn't know she had any talent in this field, but I thought she might enjoy it. Well, she came away inspired and motivated. She had found her vocation. She realized that being a food stylist was going to pay her a lot more money. This was a lesson that was very valuable because when you set a price on your ability in the marketplace, that is very self-assuring. I'd learned this myself many years ago. Today, she's a very successful food stylist. She loves her work. And recently, I saw her, and I couldn't believe how she had become this new, confident, independent woman. As you can see, it doesn't take much. Any one of us can do what we can to influence the young people in their lives. It doesn't matter whether you, what your profession is, whether you're a cashier, a car mechanic, or a CEO, whatever. We all have the opportunity to influence the young people we meet every day. These simple steps worked for me, and I know they will work for you. That's Jill. <laughs> Such a good example. Be the strong person you can be to inspire other strong people. The adage, action speaks louder than words, never rang more true. Pay attention. We don't pay attention because we all have busy lives and we never really stop and pay attention to the people around us. Empathize with their concerns. Empathy doesn't have to mean long hours, talking, a smile, a nod, a little pat can indicate to someone you know exactly how they feel. Listen, really, really listen when you talk to them. People tend not to listen. These steps will gain their trust and you can com communicate openly. As your relationship grows, give them encouragement. Urge them to take that first little step. The big ones will follow. That first step is always the hardest because fear of failure is always lurking there in the background. Stress that failure is okay. Without failure, you'll never try for your dreams. Acknowledge that change is frightening, but it can be very exhilarating. Praise, praise, praise. There can never be enough praise. Maybe the people I've helped won't remember me as fondly as I remember my mentors, but that doesn't matter because the influence you bring on their lives not only helps them, it changes your own life for the better. I will be happy if I can continue to influence the one or two young people I meet. I want them to strive to be the best that they can be. And here I'll end by quoting Queen Elizabeth II. The true measure of all our actions is how long the good in them lasts. Thank you.